God, how long have we been doing this show? The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life, it's episode 389, it is, uh, we're nearing the end of October now, of 2024, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about on the first and only wrestling podcast. WWE's on the road to Crown Jewel, still, there is a new lawsuit against... Stemming from the WWE Ring Boy scandal of the late 1980s. And AEW is building towards their next pay per view, Full Gear. And they had a puzzling dynamite this week. <laughs> Samantha Irvin has left WWE. Someone who, one of the, uh, the rare people with a unanimous approval rating. And uh, she's on her way out. And uh, Lillian Garcia, my pal, is back in. So that's uh, that's what's going on. That's generally an overview of what we're going to talk about this week. <sighs> Crowd Jewel, they're trying. <laughs> We've added the first uh, match to this show that is not for a made-up championship. It is Seth Rollins versus Bronson Reed, big Bronson Reed. Uh, find something in life you love as much as Joe Destor loves saying Big Bronson Reed. Um, <laughs> uh, that match has been added to the uh, the Saudi show for next weekend, and other than that, we're still doing bloodline storytelling and uh, Braun Breakers once again, the Intercontinental Champion, and the bloodline stuff is sprawling over every show now, and uh, just a it feels like a scattershot WWE right now because while they're building to this, they have this show next weekend. Uh, they're also building SummerSlam or uh, Survivor Series and War Games. But uh, one new match for the pay per view next weekend, and uh, two matches still already scheduled with Cody Rhodes versus Gunther and Nia Jax versus Liv Morgan. What do you think of uh, the build here for? Uh, Crown Jewel so far. What'd you think of the uh, the angle where uh, Seth and Big Bronson Reed were brawling throughout the building on Raw? And uh, how do you feel about the other build here to Crown Jewel? You know they're hitting they're hitting all the notes. You know I thought Cody's Cody's little promo on SmackDown last week for the Gunther match was fine. He was trying <laughs> to connect. He needs weird. to win this match to show his daughter that he's a good world's champion i think that's the point of that promo okay um uh, sure all right i mean he's already solved racism by defeating anthony agogo for his daughter so now he's just got to show her that he was good at wrestling i guess remember that way in <laughs> i will never forget it <laughs> the way in with anthony agogo and tall paul right tall paul white the scale that didn't work Yep. Anthony Gogo kept calling him Piss Boy, which was pretty funny. <laughs> Good times. Good times. Anyway, uh, yeah, so the, the title matches are what they're going to be. Um, yeah, I mean, Seth and, and Bronson, it feels like that's that had some excitement behind it from the crowd that nothing except maybe the Bloodline stuff <laughs> did. Like people, Seth, it, I think it helps that Seth... Unlike some other guys that have been injured this year, Seth actually went home for a while after the injury angle. He did. So yeah. I think it means more now that he's back a little bit. Um, and yeah, so I think that I thought that was a pretty good segment. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'll be interested to see because it kind of feels like if this is the first match, Bronson should still win this one. But I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we're in the business of handing out too many clean victories over Seth to, I guess this will be a test of whether or not they see they'll, they'll let any guy that they, they actually think is going to be something beat Seth. 
But do they think Bronson is like, is he going to challenge Gunther or is he going to challenge Cody down the line? I think this might be a test for that if he if he goes over Seth in a convincing way. Or Seth could just beat him and conquer the big stinky, the medium sized stinky giant, uh, Bronson Reed. So that would also be fine. Um, yeah. Why aren't the tag champs wrestling each other on this show? Uh, I don't know. There's separate number one contender tournaments going on on each show that have uh, nothing to do with <laughs> crown just, jewel. Can I'm just like, think about the level of, of coasting we would get from Finn Balor working G O D in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, uh, that's a level of coasting that I aspire to. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> that's, it's an almost build bowling into your work. Deck. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, kind of, kind of trip there to me. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, but that was that's that's my other thought. Yeah, it's like a lot of people just feel like they don't have much to do because they're waiting for for the next show. But yeah, in the meantime, uh, I think I think what they've done is fine. I think Bronson and Seth is the only match that feels like a a real match <laughs> that matters at all. Yeah, um, but it's a Saudi show, so and there's always the chance that based on the last pay per view. We might we might get a another uh, wonderful big Bill Goldberg appearance at this at this Saudi show to set up his match with Gunther, whatever that could be. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Hopefully that's uh, that's uh, this Survivor Series there. I don't know. It's uh, it's something. You know, it's been diminishing returns with Bill every time since <laughs> <laughs> since the the first comeback, but that's okay. Yeah, he and Brock had a like a real good sprint at that at that mania where Brock beats him to win the title. And then I don't think Bill's had a good match since. And that was that was in 2017. <laughs> so Yeah. But, but hey, you know, it if he if he's willing to get chopped, <laughs> like you know yeah, it's gotta be pretty safe, right? Yeah. 57 year old guy. Yeah, and as long as Gunther can, you know. Can take can take getting tackled for real, yeah. Um, then yeah, I mean it could, it could be a fun, could be a fun uh, hoss fight, uh, provided that Gunther is able to create most of the movement for the match, except for the spear. Um, one thing about Gunther is he's a wrestling genius. True. So uh, he probably will do whatever he can to make it work. Yeah. Uh, rarely. Do you see a bad Gunther match? True. <laughs> They're not all barn burners, but there's a, a, a baseline of competence. <laughs> yes, agreed. Uh, Samantha Irvin left WWE. Mm-hmm. Lillian Garcia was the ring announcer on Raw this week. And um, as uh, we were talking off the air, I was filling you in on some of the Lillian Garcia lore. Mm. Uh, she uh, She got a divorce in the last couple of years here. And moved home to like uh, take care of her elderly parents, and then they immediately died, <laughs> and so she's just like stuck with stuck with uh, figuring out their estate stuff, and she got laid off from her job, and it's going on like mission trips and stuff, and mm-hmm. uh, really needs a job, <laughs> really needs a job, really needs a victory in life. So I'm happy for Lillian Garcia that she is uh, apparently back in the fold as sure. the Raw ring announcer. Uh, but Samantha Irvin, as as mentioned, one of the very few people, I think, with a near 100% approval rating in the wrestling business. And um, she says she gave notice months ago and they couldn't come to terms on outside projects. She's a singer and wants to to do stuff outside WWE and even with the new regime they couldn't reach an agreement on that and so she left the company on Monday in the middle of the afternoon yeah it the way it, the way it came out it was like there was a blow up or she just didn't show up or something yeah. <laughs> and the way she tells the story it's like no they've known for months that uh, that I was done. Um, she was pushed by the company. For sure. She was featured by the company. And uh, now she no longer works for the company. Uh, Ricochet then released a statement saying she's not coming to AEW. I would imagine she ends up there someday. But uh, 
thoughts on uh, Lillian in Samantha out, how it all went down, all of that. Yeah, this is this is an interesting thing. I mean, I think they they did at some point on Raw acknowledge that she is gone. Um, yeah. So they didn't like completely no sell it. But the fact that it was announced by her on Twitter at like 3 p.m. Monday afternoon. Yeah, it seems fishy. <laughs> Feels sure. like there's more smoke to this story. Um, I I don't know. Feels she, like she feels like it. there was a com- Sorry, it feels like there was a conversation at the building that day. Yes, uh, you know she thanked everyone. Like I didn't see anyone omitted from her thanks when she put out her statement that she was leaving. Right. But yeah, it feels like maybe she maybe she gave notice and thought she was still going to be at that show, and then she got to the building and Lillian was there. <laughs> Is what it kind of feels like, but that's all speculation, of course. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't really know what else to make of that, other than that. Yeah, I, they still want your full commitment. I think I don't think they want to be second best, which is not necessarily a crime for for WWE not to want people to do outside projects. If you're if you're someone like a ring announcer who they. I mean, the ring announcers also like they're working as many dates as the wrestlers, like because they have to do house shows, unlike you know the the rank and file commentators and stuff. So yeah, I mean that's not a that's not any that's I know there's not as many house shows as there used to be, but it's not it's not a it's not the the cushiest gig in that company either. So yeah, if you if you have uh, desires to do anything outside of uh, be a pro wrestling ring announcer. Uh, yeah, you probably gotta cut ties at least for at least for the time being, and you know, seemed again as you said, super well liked by everybody involved. So I'm sure if she ever wanted to come back, she'd she'd be welcomed back immediately. Um, but in the meantime, yeah, well, like I said, I just think the the timing of how it all came out uh, does not scream that it was like a harmonious, uh, you know tears and hugs and flowers on the way out the door for her. A new lawsuit has been filed against WWE, Vince McMahon, Linda McMahon, and TKO regarding the allegations that a former WWE ring announcer, Mel Phillips, sexually abused underage boys while he worked with WWE in the late 80s. Yes, the late 80s. Uh, there are five uh, five victims that are suing. And they are claiming that uh, the McMahons and WWE uh, turned a blind eye to the alleged abuse. And um, this is a scandal that predates most of our time in wrestling. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know what to make of this. Um, feels like everybody has their hand out. I'm not saying that this isn't a good lawsuit. I just feels like where there's when it rains, it pours. When it, when there's smoke, there's fire. Um, seems like a good time to sue Vince McMahon, uh, but. I, I don't know. It just this is very odd to me. It's it's a scandal from thirty plus years ago. Yeah, I mean, I I can't I can't speak to the motivations of anyone involved, other than sure they they want co- some kind of compensation, and they want probably to yes to. I think something that is hit upon when they discuss this incident in the uh, Vince McMahon documentary on Netflix recently that they keep hitting um, is that outside of Phil Mushnick and the New York Post, uh, nobody touched that story when, you know, in, in that era. And as far as mainstream newspapers. Um, sure. And Phil that. Phil Donahue did cover it on TV. True, but, I, they, I shouldn't say just Phil Mushnick. It was that level of journalism, the the sort of right. tabloid and news magazine TV was kind of yeah. the highest it, it got. Yeah, that's fair. Um, you know, and Vince did sue Phil Mushnick for defamation during that during that period as well. Um, 
So it's like, it's on one hand, yeah, maybe you have a better chance of being heard now if you want to, uh, you know, and again, people are looking more closely at Vince McMahon and the wrestling business perhaps now than they would have 30 years ago or 40 years ago, whenever the, you know, previous al- these allegations were first brought to light, you know, Vince just recent, you know, in 20, was it 2023 settled a, a lawsuit with Rita Chatterton. Um, yeah. So yeah. Uh, like I said, I'm not, is it, is it just because yes, his name, he's more of a villain to the world now than he was a few years ago. And so an opportunistic lawyer put together a group of people and said, we can get something here. Yeah, probably. I'm sure, you know, lawyers don't sue people for once they don't think there's anything in it for them, you know? Right. <laughs> so yeah, there, the timing is certainly opportunistic, but you know, there was, it's hard to imagine that there was a uh, no knowledge. And I, I believe Mushnick in one of his depositions said that Vince told him that he was, suspicious of it i think was the phrase so like yeah there's there's smoke to the fire that vince and pat patterson knew that you know that mel phillips and terry garvin were doing things right and maybe that and pat patterson was accused of things himself which is a big weird part of all of this which again they do touch on in that documentary they and they have uh dynamite dave Meltzer talk about how when when the three of them were fired mel phillips terry garvin and pat patterson in the early 90s uh vince called him immediately to say that patterson was innocent and that this was just a gay witch hunt for him which has kind of always been the the gray area of pat right but i mean we talked about that when he passed Um, a million percent a million percent because it's not a secret that, you know, Pat, Pat was very openly gay. And certainly you can imagine that pro wrestlers in the eighties didn't like that guy, didn't like that about him. And also didn't like that. He was their boss, perhaps if they weren't getting good payoffs or getting, getting a push. So like, there's always been this gray area around Patterson as well. That always comes back up whenever this stuff is, is brought back to the surface. So yeah, I mean, this is a chance maybe to, (laughs) educate some people about what has been said on record before about this and what has always kind of been at the very least a gray area, if not a flat out like turning of blind eyes to what Vince and Pat and other people at the top of that company at the time knew and when they knew it, I guess. And Linda, Linda's named in the suit too, because she would have also, you know, been right there in the thick of things. So Right. Linda was the CEO or the COO mm-hmm. for uh, most of this time period here, late 80s, early 90s. And look, something that the law firm um, stated in the press release announcing that they were suing, something they said was like, this shows that sex trafficking and human trafficking have been part of the baby's culture for more than 30 years. <laughs> and whether you agree with that statement or not, it's certainly an argument that could be made. Sure. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mel Phillips was a ring announcer who was also in charge of setting up the ring, and he would hire local teenage boys <laughs> to work on the ring crew. And there's video that WWE has of him playing with a teenage boy. And it's, it's, I, I just, I'm sickened by it. It's also a scandal from over 30 years ago. I don't know what, what, what we're doing anymore, but Hey, if they can uh, get some, get something for the, uh, for the victims here. Good. Yeah. All right. Uh, AEW. Uh, is there any other WWE stuff you want to touch on? NXT has a Halloween Havoc this weekend. Mm-hmm. Uh, Spin the wheel, make the deal. Sure. Uh, another Ethan Page, Trick Williams match. Yeah. Devil's Playground, baby. Well, I'm, I'm mildly interested in the uh, the women's tag. That's Julia and Stephanie Vicker against 
Roxanne and uh, Cora. Yeah, purely respectful reasons, obviously. Sure. Um, yeah, no, I think that that looks like an all right show. I was going to mention. So there was a report that I believe originated in your uh, your <laughs> home home p- newspaper of the Wrestling Observer uh, sure. this week uh, that. Kevin Owens deal might be up, but also I believe Dave said that he was told also maybe he resigned three months ago. Yeah. And then feels like <laughs> they made it a storyline on SmackDown this week that he keeps talking about how he's not being treated well by the company. And it feels like, is this one of, are we being set up for one of those classic uh, PR wins where they try to, they try to leak that he's leaving to go to AEW when he's actually resigned. Um, I mean, that's what happened with him last time. Although I think last time he was, um, uh, maybe looking to go somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I get the sense this time that, uh, he's not looking to go anywhere. And I had also heard, um, a couple of months ago that, he had quietly resigned. I don't know that that's the case, but usually if they take the television with a storyline, um, they're pretty confident or they have, I don't dude, I don't know what to say, tell you about WWE contracts this year. Like they were like Natalia's contract expires on Friday. Also, she's wrestling on raw SmackDown and NXT this week. <laughs> Uh, Drew McIntyre's contract expires in four days. Also, he's the most pushed guy in the company over the last three months besides Phil. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, there's all kinds of weird stuff going on that I don't understand. It feels like there's they have that there's an agreement in principle, at least, or a verbal agreement, and they'll they'll hash out the deal, the contractual details later. But yeah, I don't think Kevin Owens has gone anywhere. I also heard he resigned, but. Uh, I probably heard it from Dave. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, i I think other I think other Twitter scoopsters and reporters have also said he re- resigned as well, and uh, that just got my. And I think may have been maybe maybe the voices of wrestling guys or something were saying that they think it's a, a PR play. So I was like, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you would call it that, but there is, with the exception of Ricochet. Every person this year who it leaked that their contract was coming up, WWE resigned them. <laughs> so yeah. uh, it seems like if they're if their info leaks that they're uh, you know considering their options and their deal is almost up, uh, it feels like yeah maybe this is just floated out there as a uh, which again nothing wrong with that's that's the name of the game with PR we've talked about it it's not a particularly insidious or uh evil plot to do that i just like okay i think this is one of those just, yeah I, I think this is another one of those which so i that just my my spidey sense went off a little bit about that when when they kind of made it a storyline on smackdown this week or alluded to it on in the storyline on smackdown this week what do you think we haven't really talked about that what do you think about how they're kind of parallel building this kevin owens cody rhodes thing it started on social media um it made its way to tv it's still kind of on the back burner but it's there and Mm -hmm. randy orton and kevin owens want to wrestle each other and then i would assume that uh somebody's wrestling cody here down the line whether it's on saturday night's main event or tv or sometime after survivor series it's just it's different and not something that they typically do yeah, I think they're, I mean, we talked about it a little bit last week. I think the the idea of the original angle that they did on, they shot on Twitter with the Owens attacking him after the last pay-per-view. We also forgot to mention that Dwayne was on the last pay-per-view. Well, uh, it didn't lead to anything. No, not yet. It led to a wonderful six-minute Instagram promo. Oh, what are we doing? While, while he know. walks around with the Muhammad Ali's wife's championship. <laughs> um <laughs> but anyway, he's the champion of Muhammad Ali's wife. Muhammad Ali gave him the chip. <laughs> Her wife gave him the championship. She's like, you're Muhammad Ali now. You're my husband. Ah. Now. I think that's what happened. <laughs> oh, the betrothed. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, I think that's what happened. Uh, okay. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> love Dwayne. Glad, <laughs> glad he's glad he's floating around. Uh, just 
tell telling Paul, yeah, maybe, maybe this year. We don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to see how it works out, pal. I yes, I did just get twenty five million dollars from your company. <laughs> I might get twenty dollars, twenty million dollars to do an action movie. Uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> I'll check in the day after the Royal Rumble and tell you what I decide to do. <laughs> what? Why? <laughs> ah, it just feels right. <laughs> and then we'll have to produce a documentary about how uh, <laughs> you didn't get mad <laughs> <laughs> about how actually this was your plan all along. <laughs> what? <sighs> Look, we talked about this when it came out. Yeah. How tone deaf do you have to be for to real to not realize that you forced a company to produce an hour long documentary about how you didn't screw up the plans for WrestleMania? When clearly <laughs> you screwed up the plans for WrestleMania. <laughs> oh man. You're the best. <laughs> what? The, le- the the like the the further away from reality Dwayne has gotten over the last <laughs> couple of years the more amused i have become by him it's really since the pandemic yeah (laughs) where where it's he was tricked into endorsing uh sleepy joe biden for president yeah like he just yeah anyway (laughs) anyway uh (laughs) we'll we'll get back to Dwayne whenever he uh whenever he pops back up but uh but yeah the owen stuff i think it's interesting um like I said, I don't the elements of like mixing in his contract stuff is whatever. But yeah, as far as OK, uh, eventually he's going to wrestle Cody. They give him a placeholder thing with Orton and theoretically he can go over Orton clean to get him ready for Cody. Um, so that all that all tracks logically. I think, yeah, it's just like the slot of where does this match happen? Because I think most people assume that Cody is on team good bloodline at war games so you would think he wouldn't be defending the title at that show. So that means you got to do something either on, yeah, SmackDown around there or, or as you said, they do have the Saturday's made event in December now. So yeah, I guess he seems like a long way away to wait that long to do the match. So maybe it will be on TV or something. And, and you, again, they can, they can wrestle each other eight times. So you can yeah you can do a DQ or a count out in the first one and then do whatever you're going to do after that. And you know, build to the rematch. So, yeah, I think I think this first Saturday night's main event is going to be like the first Saturday night's main event of every new deal for Saturday <laughs> night's main event they sign where they're going to try for mm-hmm. the first one. It's not going to do well. And by the end of the contract, it's going to be a WrestleMania clip show. <laughs> but they're trying for this first one, I think. By the end, Nikolai Volkov versus Coco Beware is going to be main event <laughs> of the show. <laughs> Uh yes. <laughs> Decide for yourself who the 2024 equivalent of Nikolai Volkov versus Coco Beware would be. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. AEW is building towards their full gear pay per view. They've had a million shows. They had a battle of the belts this past weekend. Um. Hey, somebody won a world title eliminator. World title eliminator on that show. Uh. <laughs> Anna Jay's going to wrestle Mariah May for the women's title at some point. Other than that, Adam Cole and MJF are still feuding. And uh, Adam Cole's back with the babyface uh, Undisputed Kingdom. Uh, I don't know if they're babyfaces or not, but... Um, kind of are. Roddy, Roddy shook Hook's hand after Hook beat him at the, the last show. Yes. So... Uh, pretty much... Oh, uh, Wrapping up WWE stuff, Motor City Machine Guns. Oh yeah, uh, are they're washed, but uh, <laughs> but they they've debuted in WWE. They, they cosmetically look enough like the Motor City Machine Guns of 15 years ago, if you don't look closely at the lines under their eyes, and <laughs> uh, they can still do their like signature moves. So they'll they've they're fine, but no, yeah. you're not going to get the the cutting edge, breathtaking you know, Dragon Gate style matches that they were doing in 2007 either. For sure. Um, AEW uh, Dynamite this week. Um, Again, rare unanimous uh, consensus, I think. Uh, This is a bad show. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it blew. Uh, I thought the main event angle was okay. (laughs) 
I think what they're doing with Orange Cassidy building him up to be John Moxley's first challenger is pretty good. Um, that unfortunately was about that took up about two minutes of the <laughs> two hour plus runtime of this show, and almost everything else on the show varied from uh bad to uninteresting to okay <laughs> so yeah just kind of it just no sauce no no life to this show they didn't have a very hot crowd either um they were in utah i think for the show but like just just a lot of stuff that didn't feel particularly uh hot on, on this yeah. show <laughs> yeah we need to address the fact that they, for whatever reason, whether it's relationships with the buildings or the perception of not wanting to come into a market and run at the smaller building, but WWE doesn't run the prestige of running in an NBA or NHL arena in a particular mm-hmm. town, whatever we've, we've, we've debated this to death. Should they run smaller buildings for dynamite yeah. stuff? When you have 3000 people, and that's a generous number in a 20,000 seat building, and you don't have a ton of experience in uh, piping in crowd noise. <laughs> mm-hmm. It makes for a really bad atmosphere for wrestling shows. <laughs> yeah, it felt like we lifeless. <laughs> we just figured out that uh, Raw should always have been two hours. <laughs> when after after more than a decade of three hour Raws, we got a two hour Raw, and I was like, holy shit. This is so much better. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think, you know, maybe they could they could uh, sweeten the crowd noise a little bit better or something. But <sighs> before any of the questionable booking uh, or the the lifeless stuff, it's like part of the what's contributing to that aesthetic is twenty five hundred, twenty two hundred, eighteen hundred people in a twenty thousand seat building, and it sounds like it. Yeah, it's it sounds sounds like a barn. Like it sounds like whatever noise they're making, um, it's not it's not reaching the mic the, the microphones. <laughs> so uh yeah, it's it's rough. Um and that certainly contributes to it. I think again, we've talked about that to death, maybe, but yeah, even even if some of the problems that AEW from like a creative standpoint, uh, they didn't just show up in the last six months. Uh, it's again, you could paper over a lot of subpar creative when you got a hot crowd that's into everything as right. WWE showcases <laughs> fairly regularly. Yeah. Um, not that all their creative is subpar, but you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a problem. The shows have poor atmosphere, uh, and they're not, they don't, they don't draw you in on, on television a lot. Um, like I said, I, I think the the overarching idea for the main storyline is is good. Um, there's individual things on the show that I didn't I didn't hate, but um, yeah, it's just it was just like watching this show in like as each segment went on in sequential order. I was like, this is just rough. It's just there's just nothing happened. It's and that to me is a much bigger crime. Like being being like where things don't make sense and something weird happens like last week in the main event where Kip Sabian ran in too soon and (laughs) hangman had to lay on the floor for like eight minutes before they could actually do the finish they were doing in the Christian J white match. Um, That was at least funny, you know, like it was bad, but it was funny. This was just like, it's just, this, this was the boring kind of bad. This was the, the just sluggish and uninteresting type of, of, of show. And that's, way worse than being like funny bad or outlandishly bad so that's the, and that's probably not gonna go away until like you said either they figure out how to make their crowds better they start piping in noise convincingly or they book smaller buildings and so the sound carries better uh, those are those are your options we'll see if they do any of them so the reports are they're still shopping or they're shopping a W shockwave, their television show that's going to replace rampage, but be rampage. Yeah. Um, 
and I would assume that they could potentially try to sell Ring of Honor as well as part of that package. And so with that lens, through that lens, Chris Jericho winning the Ring of Honor world title last night. Am I uh, just uh, connecting dots that aren't there? Or is uh, the idea, oh, television executives have heard of Chris Jericho and Chris Jericho is the Ring of Honor world champion now. Uh, that's what's going on. I don't know. That was my thought. That's I think that makes as much sense as anything. Um, and that I think was always, I don't want to speak for you, but uh, my theory when he won it the first time. Uh, and that was like, that ended up being collision, but I've always assumed that the Saturday night show was at one point pitched to WB to be ring of honor. And when that didn't happen and it was clear that wasn't happening, suddenly Claudio was the ROH world champion again. <laughs> Um, so I, maybe I'm wrong, but I've always assumed they were trying to, so yeah, that, that makes as much sense as anything. Um, cause I mean, it's not like you needed to get the belt off of Mark Briscoe, even if he's going to challenge, you know, Okada or somebody now, cause I think he's challenged for like eight different belts while being the ring of honor world champion this year. So yeah, it's not like you needed to get the belt off of him to, move him on to anything else. And also the ROH belt only matters uh, the slightest tiniest bit because Mark Briscoe was the one holding it. So yes. Um, yeah. Unless you're trying to get it its own show on an actual network. I, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't get the point of doing this other than that. It's <clears throat> something for, for Jericho to do it. Cause we always have to have something for Jericho mm-hmm. to do. So, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That makes as much sense as anything. Adam Cole is returning to the ring next week on Dynamite against uh, Buddy Matthews, uh, Matthew Buddies, uh, <laughs> Buddy Murphy, Murphy Buddy, mm-hmm. Blake and Murphy, <laughs> Blake and Murphy. Uh, yeah, so Adam Cole and, and then uh, the Young Bucks are defending the tag team title against Private Party. And Private Party have to disband if they lose. I guess their titles are changing then. I mean, I would. I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't break up private party for any reason unless <laughs> unless they're leaving the territory. Sure. Um, uh, Swerve Strickland's wrestling Shelton Benjamin and Chris Statlander is wrestling Camille next week. I will say I think they've done a pretty good job <laughs> getting you as excited as you could be for 49-year-old Shelton Benjamin. Uh, rest wrestling swerve i think they've done a slightly above average job of making that feel a little bit more important uh by letting shelton go out there with a couple of small flippy guys and just play brock like it's interesting yeah it's funny because that's never shelton never got to do that in wwe no not at all but now he's now he's a giant so uh it's the darndest thing but yeah so it's like those two matches were fun and now he has a little bit of credibility going in. You would think to lose to swerve to then set up the, I don't know if that means we're getting Lashley on that show as well on fright night dynamite, or if that's for the pay-per-view or what, what they'll do then. But uh, yeah, I mean, they've, they've done, I think if there was, there was one tiny little other bit of credit I would give them is that I thought they did a good job of making Shelton look like a killer the last couple of weeks to set him up for swerve. Oh, righty. I know you touched on it a little bit, but just anything else you want to discuss about the uh, the Green Trouser Collective uh, <laughs> angle here where John Moxley and the BCC and Marina Shafir are at the NWO. Mm-hmm. Orange Cassidy is Sting. It's uh, weird because you'd think Darby would be Sting, but... Yeah, you you would. And maybe, well, I mean, Dar- maybe Darby is in the sense that he's just gone now could be yeah but, but yes orange is the reluctant hero who doesn't want to he doesn't want to lead the squad and and everybody else is looking to him to lead the squad so uh, yeah. i i i like that idea of uh you know i have been banging the drum of what was the point of letting him be the champion for two years and then taking the belt off of him if you weren't gonna elevate him past that spot um 
so yeah, I I like Orange Cassidy as the guy, and they do have the fact that he he did he is one of like six guys in company history to have a clean win over John Moxley. So you do have a little bit of something there, even though because it's the first challenger against your new monster heel, you know he's just going to go in there and get killed. But uh, he has the tiniest shred of credibility, and it's it's I think it's an interesting idea of the idea of him becoming like the rah rah guy to, to 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 rally the baby faces who keep getting who keep getting their asses kicked. Uh, are we sticking with green trouser collective, even though the green green trousers haven't really appeared the last couple of weeks. Yeah, no, I think I think Yuta wore because he wore like Danielson's exact outfit from his debut. Ah. On on the show, I think maybe last week. So there, there's but there's less and less green trousers uh, amongst the green trouser collective lately. So I may have to come up with a new, a new, a new moniker soon. But uh, yeah, I, I guess that I think that stuff's fine. But it's it's because of the nature of the story, it can't it can't be the whole show unless they just stand in the ring and just beat everybody's ass for two hours. Which you know, I'm not saying that would be worse than you know adam cole cutting promos. it would have been better than this week's episode yes yeah (laughs) adam cole cutting promos against a video screen uh but uh but yeah i understand you can't have every segment be about that so it has to kind of be limited and you never know when they're going to show up and all that so uh by result the rest of the show feels pretty dire because nothing else really feels like it's clicking at all on the show but uh but hey uh Kyle Fletcher has a new haircut, so stakes have never been higher. He is a man. That's right. He's not a, he's not a cowboy. He's a cow man. Yes, exactly. Um, the Hardy Boys and Joe Hendry are uh, at an NBA game being terrible. <laughs> oh, this is from yesterday. Never mind. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, NXT Halloween Havoc in Hershey, Pennsylvania, one of those old old school WWF towns. <laughs> uh, this weekend, Doctor Zorian uh, stomping grounds, isn't it? Yep, 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 yep. All right. Uh, uh, uh Hiroshi Tanahashi's retiring next year, and uh, Evil wants to retire him at the. Uh, uh, he's retiring rather January fourth, twenty twenty six. Evil wants to retire at January fourth, twenty twenty five. We have our first Wrestle Kingdom match, and it's Hiroshi Tanahashi <laughs> versus e- Evil. Look, you'll find no bigger critic of <laughs> Evil being uh, anywhere near the top of a card on a Wrestle Kingdom than I. But given his his style of match, it does mean that 18 people can run in, and that really limits the amount of mo- uh, moving that Tanahashi will have to do. Yes. So there is that, as far as like smoke and mirrors uh a match for for tanahashi that can still be a relatively marquee singles match all right anything else you want to talk about uh apparently there's a a donald a, a kamala harris attack ad featuring donald trump in pictures with vince mcmahon and jeffrey epstein that just aired i just uh, saw that too. during uh during the the game on tnt the nba game so Hey, is that from our uh, from our pal Danny? Yeah, from our pal Danny. Yeah, Danny. Uh, Danny. Danny's a good guy. Yeah, <laughs> he protected you from the crew. He did. He did. All right. Well, until uh, next time, everybody. Uh, I'm Ethan, and I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Adios. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. Were you, um, I feel like uh, these places are already gone out of business by the time you were growing up, but uh, did you ever go to a uh, DZ Discovery Zone or a place like that? No, I don't think I did. I think I. I mean, I've been to like the Maryland Science Center, <laughs> but and they not... have like an obstacle course or whatever. Yeah, yeah. There's like some. There's like a game, a game room or two. 
Sure. After all the learning is done, <laughs> if memory serves. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's like a, one of that machine where you can crank the thing and it makes a tornado in the water. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, there's like the little, there's like a, yeah, some kind of jungle gym thing or something you could climb or, yeah, there's. But yeah, no, I never went to like a D- <laughs> Discovery Zone or like a, or even like a Chuck E. Cheese, Cheese or. A, have you ever been to a place with a ball pit? I've been, I think, I think <laughs> some some of the, I've been to a fancier McDonald's that had a, <laughs> that had one of those indoor playgrounds. Like sure. Okay. The breeding ground for <laughs> disease. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. What about you? Was that a, was that a, was that a staple of your your younger years? Yeah, ages eight to ten or so. Mm-hmm. There's a sweet spot there where uh, you have to be, yeah, you have to be coordinated enough to uh, climb on all the stuff, <laughs> but uh, not so old that it bores you. <laughs> you know what I mean? That is, yeah, that is a narrow. <laughs> So, like, I think the sweet spot for me was between ages eight, eight and nine, eight and ten, something like that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I guess the I don't know what happened, but those places don't exist anymore. So. What do you know about that? There has to be something, right? There has to be something else that. I mean, there are still Chuck E. Cheese's, but they don't. Right. I'm sure there's a ball pit, uh, but as far as like the obstacle, obstacle course kind mm-hmm. of stuff, I don't know. Huh. I don't know. I just don't know. The kid, the kids yearn for axe throwing now. That's all they want to do. Uh, isn't that for? Uh, never mind. <laughs> I don't think they like kids axe throw. I could be wrong. <laughs> no, it seems like they do. No, I think they do. Just trying to think of a trendy. Yeah, outing. Like, you, you don't go bowling anymore. You you go axe throwing. Remember big bowling's. Uh... <laughs> A marketing campaign trying to get people to go bowling. <laughs> it was called Go Bowling. <laughs> <laughs> so, like the National Association of Bowling Companies. Yeah, it's like Brunswick and uh, I don't know some who two or there are two or three big companies, of course, that own all of the bowling alleys. Sure, and they sure. got to they got together and uh, they started a campaign called Go Bowling. <laughs> It's just hey, go bowling, go you bowling about today. <laughs> huh? What well, do you know? Big bowling is advertising on this program. Uh, it's it's usually a bowling program that they're advertising on, though. <laughs> I don't know. If you're predisposed to watch bowling on television, you probably don't need to be told to, to go. go bowling. <laughs> yeah. Think about bowling, and this is probably I'm probably just riffing on a thousand comedians' bits here, but no, it's, it's good. Uh, What's the shoe thing? Like that probably made sense in like the 1930s when everyone's shoes were made of like paper and covered in like <laughs> my oil and mine dust and stuff. <laughs> and we were trying to keep the the floors clean, but it's like sure. the idea that I still have to pay to wear some old leathery disgusting well, things to for grip purposes. Yeah, preposterous to me. Oh, for sure, it's a scam. Uh, at the same time, you know, I mean, occasionally if you're a kid, uh, they would let you bowl in your sneakers sometimes. Mm-hmm. And then, so that lets you know that it's a scam. Yes. But uh, I don't really have a problem with uh, with the shoe rental thing. It, it, you know, it's gross, but it's probably it's probably also better. Again, having not been bowling in <laughs> 20 years, 20 years, there's probably right. like minimal uh, hygiene requirements now that weren't in place. Oh, oh, sure. In the late nineties. Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. I've been bowling uh once in the last ten years or so, and um, s- still vaguely smelled like cigarette smoke in the bowling alley. <laughs> even though you haven't been able to smoke indoors in Maryland in thirty years. Sure. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. You know, it was fine. There was a like a one week stretch. When I was in my early 20s, late teens, early 20s, maybe, mm-hmm. where I got hooked on bowling. <laughs> like, I was driving a, deliver- a delivery van for a trophy store, and I would stop. 
I would build in time during my deliveries to stop at a bowling alley. <laughs> like I bowl, I bowled every day for a week. <laughs> it's like, man, I am going to get good at this. And uh, I never really got good at it. And I was just goofing off on the clock. So I stopped. That is an impressive level of <laughs> of goofing off on the company. I, I respect it immensely. I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's not that's not the place that laid me off a of Black Friday. <laughs> oh, this was a different one. Yeah, this is the first one, the first trophy. Oh, right, story. oh the the classic trophy store class. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what do you know? Anyway, well, here we are. We've riffed quite a bit here. And uh, now it's, uh, it's wrestling time. 389, finally. I feel like we've we've uh, we've climbed the mountain here today. I gave you the I don't I didn't realize I didn't do this on purpose. I gave you the wrong number last week. And I and I so I very crudely edited myself saying eight <laughs> over over top of your voice. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, I just trust you and didn't check. Um, all right. Well, <laughs> welcome to 389. Basically. <laughs> That's fantastic. Like, I thought it was a better bit if, like, I just, I made it as crude and, like. Yes. And obvious as possible that I had overdubbed your your voice. Oh, yes, without question. All right, I'm sure the listener enjoyed that. I try to keep on keeping on.